Welcome back again at the New Times and thanks for keeping up with us. Today you have uh, very amazing people on the panel with me and we're going to have a conversation about liberation. Me, your moderator, I'm Jade Natasha Iriza and I'll pass the mic for them to introduce themselves. Thank you. My name is Vanessa Zuba Mutesi. I am a writer, a comms enthusiast, an MC, a host. I'm a jack of many trades. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Let's hear from Christian. Uh, thank you so much. My name is uh, Christian Inuari, aka manager. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I also do so many things. But since we are talking about liberation today, I do, uh, uh, I'll say, is this social community work? And uh, uh, businessman and uh, a creative uh, director, entrepreneur, and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here today and uh, enjoying this conversation. Okay, so let's just dive right in and I'll start from my right. What do you think liberation means to you personally? That's a heavy question, you know. But I think for me, liberation is a symbol of strength. It's a symbol of hope and unity. Because I feel like for what we know as liberation, for what we enjoy as a country, the safety, the mere happiness of just being a Rwandan comes from the strength, the resilience, and the, and the unwavering unity that a lot of Rwandans, uh, Rwandans around uh, the world formed in bringing hope back to our country. So for me, it's just a symbol of so many great things, but also a symbol of greatness, because I think we stand as one of the strongest and one of the best testaments of uh, rebuilding, reuniting, because there's no country that has a history like ours uh, and has rebuilt itself as quick as we have. So I think liberation is, is a wide array of things, but just majority of it is just unity, strength and resilience. So unity, strength and resilience, that's, that sounds powerful. But again, what do you think shows that Rwandans were or are liberated? Like how would you explain to that to someone who does not have an idea of what really Rwanda is about? I think Zuba uh, pretty much talked about it, but looking at our history, uh, we have a very, very complicated uh, history going back. Um, and when you talk about liberation, uh, what are you being liberated uh, from? Uh, uh, what is the issue before the liberation comes in, you know? So what shows that we are liberated is that today uh, no one uh, can deny you of being Rwandan, you know? Today, you have access to healthcare, you have ad access to education. Uh, before the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, uh, it was like taboo being uh, having access to education when you're a Tutsi. And today, uh, you don't have to present an ID to go to school, you just need to have uh, what takes in terms of uh, grades and uh, 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 the, the, your, your, your success in class uh, uh, determines what and where you're going to school uh, instead of just showing the ID and uh, as, as a proof that you deserve to be in that school. So that's what liberation means to me and being free. Uh, a few days ago I was with uh, uh, someone from the Western countries and they're like, are you, are you guys free? I was like, what do you mean by being free? Free is going around without uh, thinking twice that your life is in danger because you are this or that. And uh, being free means uh, free to, free from the, the, the being denied of, your identity, we are around these, you know. So I think pretty much that's what liberation is to me. And when you look 
to what Rwanda is today. Yeah, we are liberated. Uh, actually, we are more than liberated because we are enjoying uh, the freedom we have today. From hearing you speak, I can understand that it requires someone to have a great deal of understanding of the history for them to understand the concept of liberation. I mean, how many countries do really have an independence day and a liberation day celebrated four days apart? So. Um, it, it, it requires one to understand deeply what the real point is all about. But again, do you think um, it has been a smooth process? Do you think Rwandans have the unity and the reconciliation and there hasn't been any challenges and we are good? You know, I can't say it's been a smooth process because it, it was very traumatic. So on one end, uh, you have to acknowledge the fact that in the process of rebuilding this, a lot of people didn't have the time of, you know, being aware of their trauma, taking care of themselves, you know, having that moment, you know, you got here, you have to start rebuilding, cleaning up, you know, finding a way to bring some form of order back to the country. So, of course, it can't be smooth because for a lot of people, once you're out of work, you're retiring, some of that trauma haunts you or it haunts you even in the work you do. So I think it, it can't be smooth because there's a lot of people in our society that live with so much trauma that they've never had the space to address because either this happened when you're too young, by the time you had the time to address it, you're also starting your own family. Or you got in, you had to start being part of the policy making, uh, bringing some form of structure because we didn't have a government, we didn't have anything running, you know. So I think for, for a lot of that process, it was firstly getting the essentials, structure, law, government, you know, hospitals running, all those things. And then in the process, of course, you have to factor in all these different things because, you know, for other countries that have had the, the privilege of not having such traumatic events, we have to catch up because in the time that you guys were advancing, we were cleaning up. We were working on rebuilding this whole entire Rwanda that a lot of people see, you know. So I think in that sense it can't be easy and of course there's challenges because you have to cater to your own people, uh, make sure that you're communicating with the world and connecting with the world because obviously you have to make some form of relationship that that's what keeps a country going and that's what keeps all of our affairs running because we need that collaboration. So I think it, it, it comes with a lot of challenges both on a personal level for the different people who are involved in this from policy makers to even us everyday people. Um, and then even on the policy end, because you have to think, the people you're catering to are a very uh, particular group, you know? It's not everyone that's going to be like a Rwandan. It's not everyone that's going to have a history like a Rwandan. So you also have to think in terms of policy making, is this something that can actually work for this particular kind of people living with this history? So I think it's, it is a consistent challenge because you have to be ahead of the game both on a global sense, but even on a personal sense when you bring when you bring the solutions home. So definitely I think it comes with its challenges, but we have addressed it fantastically. I think we have a, a very amazing leadership that has clearly put its people at the forefront because there's no way we would have made Rwanda what it is without that collective effort. So I think we are a very unified people. Our history has unified us to the extent that, you know, we're all driven to, to make sure that those challenges do not become hindrances but are stepping stones for us to get to a, to a better place. Just by hearing everything you just said, I feel like saying, whew, we've been through it, yeah? So, but now, you've, you've ended it on a positive note and I think there are things to actually be proud of. And it said that Rwanda is leading Africa and the world in most of, in many things. What do you think are some of the indicators of that development that you're most proud of? I think when you look at the tourism sector, uh, that's one thing. When you look at the leadership, that's actually that should come before everything because it all uh, goes with the leadership at the end of the day. Of course, when you're driving uh, a racing car, the co-pilot is going to get an award at the end of the day if you win. but. The person who's doing the job is the pirate. So when you have the pirate who is not good enough, uh, there is no reward. So I think it starts from the leadership we have today. That's uh, one thing uh, we should all be proud of as Rwandans. 
Uh, second, uh, when you look in different sectors, uh, like tourism is one. Uh, today, Rwanda is a tech hub. Uh, we just had the uh, uh, FinTech uh, the Summit. We have other big, huge conferences that have been happening in this country we should be proud of. Yeah, sports, when you look at uh, the games we have hosted as as Rwanda uh, and Rwandans, we should be proud of uh, uh, those kind of achievements. Sometimes you don't give it so much credit. Uh, when you look at the uh, women in the parliament, and uh, that's something I don't think we've ever had that in any African country before. So that should be things we look at and be proud of uh, how far we've got as a country. And uh, we should also, as Rwandans, especially the younger generation, uh, not only just to be proud, but to also uh, support in that rebuilding process. Because uh, if we don't step into the, the, the what have been achieved and protect that, uh, I don't think we'll have... Uh, a country we want to see in the next 50, 100 years to come. So we shouldn't be just uh, proud of what have been achieved, but also working towards achieving more and protecting what have been achieved. Hearing you speak again, um, one hears that you're hinting at homegrown initiatives, things you find in Rwanda, but you won't find elsewhere, right? So do you th would you think of one specific homegrown initiative that has been really significantly impacting the post-liberation Rwanda that even the whole continent could learn from? He's sitting right here prime example <laughs> uh, I think our past is, is and I'm not saying this because it's sitting there but genuinely is one of the initiatives that I can say is different because it's youth it's run by the youth it's not run by the government it's not run by the older generation who you would you know tend to have a more fonder approach or outlook on this but it's run by young people and it's not only doing work for community in terms of the people who are directly affected but it's also sensitizing us uh, me being part of them like me starting to attend some of the our past initiative gatherings made me want to learn more about my history and even in hindsight it's something that i was grateful for because in my entire time when i was outside of rwanda for school i had the opportunity to like debunk a lot of myths in terms of what people thought rwanda was or what um you know what people called the rwandan war when it's really a genocide against against the tutsi so in that sense in being able to light that fire in the youth that you need to learn about your history i think that is something that is so powerful and i think that it's something that is lost not only on the african continent but for the youth in general, there's a lot of people that grow up, even now, like in Rwanda, who are like, oh, the genocide started in 1994, when really it goes way back to like 60s, late 50s. And all of that, you cannot learn if you don't have that fire lit in you. So when you have initiatives like our past, who are not only focused on ensuring that survivors are not forgotten and of not felt forgotten, uh, and ensuring that us, the youth, know our history, and know the part that you can play it goes beyond being able to attend you know renovating a house it goes beyond donating it goes into you know how much of your history are you imparting on on your peers the people around you how are you using your platforms to sensitize the people around you how what part are you doing because at some point we're going to all take up the mantle not all of us are going to end up in government. You know, they say we're the leaders of tomorrow, but leading doesn't mean that you have to be in office. Leading means you are in your area and you're doing whatever you can, as best you can, to the best of your capabilities. But a lot of that comes with being able to learn, which is what our past has done 
a fantastic job of. So I think if we had a lot of those youth-centered initiatives that are harnessing the power of history, because there's so many countries on the continent that have trauma, that have gone through wars, that have gone through coup d'etats, even now that are still going through it. So you can imagine for children growing up in that, it's either they're going to hate their history because of how traumatic it is, instead of learning from it, which is what our past has done. Instead of us hating it and being like, oh, we hate these people, we hate all of this, what can we learn, what can we do? Speaking um, of the experience of other African countries, you find that most of the time uh, the concept of patriotism or the love of the country is often linked to the idea of independence, getting independence from the colonizers. But ours is a bit different. So do you think the, the concept of patriotism has evolved um, ever since the 1994? Or basically, what do you think patriotism looks like now? Does it look like your fellow people who are doing great and amazing things basically t take us through it so i think uh first of all it, uh, patriotism doesn't start from 1994 yeah uh, when you go back in in the history during the the royal uh time uh rwandans were known for you know being warriors uh fighters uh, protectors and all that, uh, sacrificing everything they have just to, uh, for the sake of saving uh, their own. We kind of switched when the Western world came here to teach us otherwise. And somehow, uh, some Rwandans who were brave enough, they said, no, this is not okay. Uh, we should do something. That was a kind of a reminder of what uh, uh, patriotism should look like. Uh, sacrificing everything you have, uh, not because you're expecting to get a reward from it, but because you say, okay, as a human being, this is the right choice to make. So that's what uh, patriotism uh, looks like to me. And again, not only that you say, okay, there is a genocide happening in my country, we should stop that. But also after uh, stopping the genocide, sitting down and be like, okay, should we kill these people who killed our, our relatives and families and everyone? Or we should move on as a country and teach them uh, how to make the right choices and build uh, a country where all Rwandans uh, are united and understand what being a Rwandan means. To me, that was the, 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 the something actually I've never seen done before because uh, when you go in the history, there is nowhere someone uh, go to power and say, okay, somehow we are going to uh, teach you A, B, C, D to, you know, teach you how to be a human again that's so hard and to me that was that was more than just being brave and uh, uh, it was it's it's a that's the biggest form of patriotism not only that you deciding to forgive someone but you also decide to hold their hand and say okay let's move forward not that we're going to forget but let's learn from what happened and move forward to avoid such uh, atrocities to to ever happen again to me that's that's uh, patriotism yeah uh, but now what do we make of those falsehoods or um, tweaking of words you see when you were asked are you really free you know such such ideas or propaganda that we see um, on the international TVs or news outlets what do we make of those do you think all young people in, in the country right now are equipped enough to tell which ones are facts, which ones are purely um, w having an agenda they're following. So basically, what do we make of that? On a global scale, I, to a certain extent, I understand because I hate to say it and it sounds extreme, but a lot of the Western world is ignorant to what um, African history is because they've written it from their perspective as colonizers, so we've never really had the opportunity to write our own story and tell our own story. So naturally, falsehoods are going to come out of that. 
and even being able to interact with that world that's how i came to empathize with them because for a lot of them like you find kids who've never left the united states it's like the same as a child who's never left rwanda you don't think there's like the world out there sounds insane right now for them it it, it it's hard to empathize because a kid from rwanda they may not have the resources and say oh i'm gonna go to a school with internet and what but there even your public schools like your average public school you have wi-fi you have a computer so it's like you just you just want to be ignorant but for us it's it's really on our shoulders because we have to remember especially those of us who have the privilege those of us who are born into privilege we have to remember that a lot of this pressure is on our shoulders because I, for example, for me, why, the reason why I take it personally is because I have no excuse. I've grown up in a good home. I've grown up in a very safe Rwanda. I've gone to good schools. Those are all privileges that your average Rwandan does not have. So for me, who has those resources, it comes down to how well am I using my privilege? How well am I using the resources I have, the accessibility to different places and people that I have? How do I use it to not just my advantage, but be able to bring some form of uh, hope to somebody else, you know? So I think that a lot of Rwandans are not equipped, unfortunately, but there's more. There's a lot of hope. It's not saying it in the sense that we're not doing anything. There's a lot of hope, and I think it comes down to both us, uh, the younger generation, but the older one. I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of bridging the gap between the older generation and the younger generation so that we can have these crucial conversations because... At the end of the day, we're going to be picking up from where they're, they're leaving it. So if we don't know the vision that they have, we could come in and do whatever we want and be like, okay, since we're taking it up from here, let's just uproot and freestyle and hope for the best, right? But that can do a lot of the work and the sacrifice that they have made. But if we, we have the time to bridge that gap, then we're able to sit down and say, like, if you're from the older generation, what do you envision for me as a leader taking up for you? What do you envision for the future of someone who's going to be coming younger than me, who's like 10 years old now? You know, these are things that we need to be talking about because they also help us, you know, cancel out the falsehoods. It helps us, those of us who now have the privilege of like rewriting our parents' stories from their point of view and not from like the colonizers, we have to have these conversations. So I think we have, as the youth, we have to take the initiative and, and have that, you know, chest and vim to have those conversations, as difficult as they may be. But even the older generation, you know, being open to it, and I know it may be triggering at times, and I think that's also when you realize how important your mental health is, but it's also important for you as a parent, as a policy maker, whatever position you're in, to impart that knowledge, because without it, we're also going to ride on the falsehoods and say, okay, you're right, you know? So at the end of the day, it all comes down to how much do we understand our history and how much do we understand where we are right now and where we want to be. So 29 years from right now, do you think the concept of liberation would have changed? Do you think Rwanda is doing a good job in imparting the same, um, the same ideas, the same values, the same patriotism to the next generations? Do you think we are doing a good good job as young people in continuing the line yes and no uh, because we need to look back and uh, celebrate the success of what have been achieved in the then looking ahead we also need to find ways what have been achieved can be protected and how can we achieve more so as the younger generation i think we are still somehow figuring out how to to move forward uh, which i think with the technology and all the uh, facilities we have today uh, that can help us to uh, have access to the right uh, uh, source of information and everything we can do that but again uh, I also um, kind of um, want to encourage the older generation. I was going to say that I'm kind of disappointed. I am not disappointed. I am so proud of you. But you need to, uh, to push a little bit harder than we are doing today because what I'm saying is, can you help us understand you know, 
it's not just uh, looking at you, I'm not going to see that you're struggling. And if you're struggling, are you struggling? What are you struggling uh, uh, with? You know, how can I help? Uh, if you're talking about uh, let's rebuild our country and invest A, B, C, D, how can I be involved? Because the issue is not, of course, some of us, we just want to go where everyone is going. Uh, and most of the time when you get there and it's interesting, we stay. But when we get there and it's not interesting, we take another path. So help us to uh, make it as interesting as it can be. Because uh, we, want, we want your guidance, but uh, we, know we are not getting enough. Uh, to me, uh, I think that's that's for the younger generation. We need to push a little bit harder, also. But the older generation, we need your guidance. Uh, I think the concept of liberation is uh, after 20, 29 years. Actually, with the younger generation, on that point specifically, it's it's still the same. It will be the same. Yeah, because. I think they, they they can they can see they can see and they know what to do, uh, but sometimes they just need that one person to point where you have the confusion and be like, okay, this is the right direction. So um, the conclusion you just took is that yes, the concept of liberation will still be the same 20 years, 29 years from here. But again, we need to be very objective about this and specific. For example, and careful, <laughs> thank you. So, for example, you as, let's say, a future parent or just say a future leader or just a future citizen in the same kind of Rwanda that we are in right now, what are three things that you're gonna teach the next generation or your kids? Ah, three things. That's, that's a limiting list, hey? Um, number one, there's nothing out of your reach. Just because it's a small country doesn't mean that there's something impossible, you know? Small but mighty. So, whatever you want to do, it's possible. Uh, and I think our history clearly shows it because there's no way we've, we've reached where we are. 29 years. Think of someone who's 29 years of age. For them to have gone what Rwanda has gone through, um, be ranked as one of the best of many different categories, surely, small but mighty. Uh, second of all, your history, no matter how boring you feel, you no matter how disconnected, just because uh, you weren't born during the genocide or shortly after, doesn't mean that you cannot empathize, number one. You cannot play your part. We all have a part to play. I would say the privilege of even seeing this firsthand, of seeing a woman sitting next to another woman whose husband killed her whole entire family. That is kindness. That is the utmost form of kindness and forgiveness so if you can think of that person who can look at someone who may have killed their family took away their parents took away their wife their children and they can be kind in the face of someone who did such atrocious things surely you can be kind to your neighbor so in all things be kind because kindness is what builds relationships it's what has gotten us here to be unified and it's what also forms our relationships with outside countries you know a big part of why rwanda has the reputation it has is because of who we are Ubumunu Tujira. so i think kindness um learning your history and knowing that that's what help you that's what helps you safeguard it and just just be ready for the challenge because it's going, going to be one heck of a ride. <laughs> I don't know why I'm answering after Zuba because <laughs> I don't know how she does it, but she's saying everything. But one thing I think I will have to teach my kids, one is uh, uh, to be selfless. That's one. Two to always remember that there is no great feelings that having your own country that is called home because our the older generation many of them struggled with not having where you, 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 you can say you know this is home and uh, third one um, that will be 
uh, kindness and uh, that's what will help them to uh, like she said uh, it's like having money <laughs> it's easier to to it's it's easier to make money than uh, that's how they say to to keep it yeah so I think we should always remind ourselves of how lucky we are being uh, in this country being called Rwandans. Uh, I think today uh, having kids uh, when I have them and call them uh, Rwandans and telling them that they have a country uh, will be the greatest feeling, you know. So that's pretty much what I'm going to teach them to remind them that it's 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 a privilege. Uh, born and raised in this country being born and raised in this country so yeah what you all just said is very beautiful and I feel like if we have parents more parents and more leaders in the future who think like that then we're gonna have surely a better Rwanda but again um, I feel like now we need to also add <laughs> to that and I'm going to you know feel free to add them um, we are having these conversations for ourselves, but also for those who come after us, who look back and be like, somewhere in 2023, there was this conversation that were had by people who are no longer young anymore, and they talked about one, two, three. So these are our contributions to, to, that, to that archive that will be there at that time, to that history lesson that will be then. So we, I, th I feel like, one thing to our generation is to feel free to learn and hence contribute to the documentation to the contribution of ideas and everything so that we keep this country but also to to for, for someone to to have something to look um to look at when they when they come when it's their turn to be young in this country so of course visit the new times for that <laughs> any parting thoughts it costs zero Rwandan francs or zero US dollar to be kind. Retweet. <laughs> Thank you for staying with us until the end of this conversation. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed um, hosting these very, very interesting minds on our platforms today. For more information, you can visit our website on www.newtimes.rw and our different social platforms. Thank you.